and just want to say good morning to everybody and welcome um, to the third day of National Public Health Week. I'm Heather Drake. I'm the Membership and Engagement Director with the Maine Public Health Association. So we're really excited to be celebrating all things public health this week and to have Sarah Woodbury with Defend Our Health with us this morning uh, to talk about the current state of PFAS in Maine. So thank you all for being here. Uh, we really appreciate it. A uh, couple housekeeping items to go over as we get started. Um, so we are, as you should have been alerted as you come in, came into the room, we are recording today's webinar. So we will have it available on our website um, and we'll send it out to all registrants as well. And I will apologize if you hear anything in the background this morning, so hopefully it's not too loud. Um, as you enter, I, I encourage you to please introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know where you're calling in from today. We do ask that you stay muted um, throughout the presentation and then you're, you're fine to come off mute during the Q&A if you have any questions. And you can also enter any questions into the chat as we go through the presentation. And you should have access to closed captioning as well if you need that. Um, just a couple other things about National Public Health Week. We are hosting a members walk and networking event tomorrow at 4.30. So if you're a member of MPHA, we encourage you to join us. That'll be in the Portland area. And I'll put a link to the chat, um, or I'll put a link to RSVP in the chat. And then um, if you're not a member, we really encourage you to become one. Your, your membership helps us and enables us to do the work that we do advocating and educating on public health in Maine. And we are running a membership special this week in honor of National Public Health Week. And I'll put the link in the chat to that as well. Um, but I think that's it uh, right now. I will turn it over to Sarah Bridges who will introduce Sarah Woodbury and help facilitate uh, today's presentation. Great, thanks Heather. Good morning, everybody. Um, Sarah Bridges, I'm one of the co-leaders of the Climate Issue-Based Member Section for MPHA. Uh, and I have the honor of introducing um, Sarah Woodbury today, who is our speaker. She's the Director of Advocacy for Defend Our Health. Uh, she works closely with legislators, coalition partners, and supporters to advance Defend Our Health's mission of fighting for safe products, food and drinking water, and sustainable green jobs. Sarah brings with her over 10 years of experience in the advocacy and communications realm. She's very knowledgeable about PFAS and everything going on in Maine, what's happening with the legislation, you know, in recent years and this year as well. Uh, so I will turn it over to Sarah to kick off her presentation. And thanks so much for being here today with us, Sarah. Thank you guys so much. I'm gonna attempt to share my screen. Um, last time I tried this in another presentation, it didn't work so well, but fingers crossed that it actually does what it's supposed to do this time, so. Okay, can folks see that? Yes. And are my slides moving? <laughs> yes. Perfect. Okay, as Sarah um, and Heather said, my name is Sarah Woodbury. I'm the Director of Advocacy for Defend Our Health. And Defend works every day to make sure that everyone has equal access to safe food, safe drinking water, um, healthy homes, and toxic-free climate-friendly products. Um, and so we have been working with the issue of PFAS since probably around 2017, when the issue first started to bubble in the state of Maine, um, you know, with the, the finding of Fred Stone's farm in um, Arundel Stone Ridge Farm that um, was contaminated with PFAS. Uh, so we, we have kind of been engaged since then. Um, and it has, as you all know, really bubbled up as a major issue for the state of Maine in the past couple of years. So what I will do is kind of give a brief overview of what PFAS is, where you can find it, and then kind of dig into what the state of Maine is doing, and then we can open it up for questions. I hope my presentation won't take too horribly long because I'd like for us to, to save a lot of time for folks that, that might have questions that I can hopefully answer. So um, what is PFAS? So PFAS is a class of fluorinated chemicals. Um, the kind of definition is one carbon fluorine bond. It is the strongest bond in science. In chemistry, um, it's very hard to break down. Um, and that makes it good for creating um, things that are like greaseproof, stain resistant, waterproof. So your 
pants that have like Teflon coating on them, that is PFAS. If you have a rain jacket that has like Vortex or other some other um, water resistant coating on it, that is probably PFAS. If your carpets and rugs are treated to be stain resistant, that is PFAS. It is unfortunately kind of ubiquitous in the world that we live in. Um, it's also used in like food packaging. So if you have microwave popcorn, it's in there. If you buy, um, you know, something from the grocery store that's wrapped in paper that is grease resistant, that probably has PFAS in it. It's in dental floss, it's in makeup, it's in, you know, a whole host of issues or a whole host of products, which makes it very, very hard to avoid, unfortunately. So PFAS, as they have found, um, and when I say PFAS, I am talking about a class of about 12 to 14,000 chemicals. Sometimes you'll hear folks say PFOS or PFOA or other acronyms for these chemicals. They are all part of the, P, uh, the PFAS family. So they all exhibit similar characteristics of the strong carbon fluorine bond. And the thing that makes it, they don't break down, they make things grease resistant, you know, waterproof, that type of stuff. So it's a whole host of chemicals. And so because it is so ubiquitous, because it isn't everything, it, you know, kind of all around us, more than 98% of people have a level of PFAS in their blood. That is problematic and troubling for a variety of reasons, particularly health impacts. So studies have shown that PFAS can interfere with normal brain development in children. It increases the risk of certain type of cancers, um, like kidney cancer, prostate cancer. Um, it can lead to fertility issues, particularly in men. Um, it's an, it's uh, immunosuppression, it's a hormone disruptor, causes liver and thyroid issues. Some of the new data that's come out around health impacts that's particularly concerning for these times that we're living in right now is that it can interfere with the efficacy, efficacy excuse me, of a vaccine. So um, there's been some studies done around like the COVID vaccine and PFAS and have shown that like the, um, the exposure to PFAS can kind of interfere with the efficacy of that vaccine, which, you know, these days is, is troubling. Um, if for you public health folks, Dr. Granjean from Harvard has done a lot of work around this, if you want to kind of Google some of his studies. And as I mentioned, it's very persistent. Um, it doesn't break down. It's bioaccumulative. It is dubbed a forever chemical for a reason. It has a, an amazing half-life. It sticks around in the environment for a very long time. It sticks around in your body for a very long time. And that means that for it's at least to high levels of contamination in some ways. So if you have a home garden, for instance, and you buy some compost that has um, PFAS in it, and you put that compost on your yard. If you do it one time, it might not maybe be that big of a deal. Um, you might not end up with a lot of PFAS. It might not even meet the state screening levels. But if you continue to buy compost every year and put it in the same place over and over again, because PFAS bioaccumulates, that will build up in your soil. It will build up in your water. So it's something that's done over time. So Maine has been kind of a leader around the issue of dealing with PFAS. We, are one, we have been one of the first states that's taken a lot of, of pretty amazing action to try to prevent further contamination. Um, so like I said, we've been working on this, particularly from the policy perspective since around 2017. And in that time, we have managed to get the work with, you know, some amazing legislators to get some really great um, policy put in place, some bills passed. Um, so we passed a food packaging law in 2019. We were the second state to do that. Washington was the first. So what that law does is ban, first off, the use of phthalates, which is another um, hormone disrupting chemical in food packaging. And it also bans the use of PFAS in food packaging, assuming an alternative is available. And there are alternatives available. There's all sorts of studies that show that alternatives are available. The state um, is in the process of kind of implementing that, that food packaging law. And we've actually seen a lot of um, action kind of from big corporations that are moving away from it. So like Burger King, um, Chick-fil-A, Starbucks, Whole Foods, they have all made public promises to move away from food packaging that contains PFAS. Um, and they've all done it over the past couple of years, which has been really great. So these big giant corporations that are responsible for a lot of the purchase of food packaging that contains this stuff are moving away from it, which means that the market will start to shift. Um, because, you know, people actually like companies actually make products for Burger King. And so the state of Maine night is probably not as big of a customer as Burger King. So the fact that Burger King and Chick-fil-A have moved away from it means that the market will start to automatically shift anyway, which is a good thing. 
Um, so last year we passed a bill um, that requires that the Department of Environmental Protection test um, farmland. So the DEP, so the DEP has a list of farmlands across the state. There's about 700 farms on this list. These 700 farms have utilized what is called bio, euphemistically called biosolids, um, which was like an industry term that they got folks to use to make it sound less disgusting than it actually is. Um, what it actually is is like sludge from wastewater treatment facilities. And so this sludge has been utilized, every state does this, not just Maine, has been utilized um, for generations on farmland as a cheap source of fertilizer for the farms. And there's, they're not wrong. It is a good source of fertilizer for farms. Unfortunately, it's not, it's not just human waste that gets into our wastewater treatment facilities. It's everything you flush down the toilet. It's everything you wash down the drain. And that includes products with PFAS in them. So this sludge or biosolids were what contaminated Fred Stone's farm. And because of that contamination, we worked with Lori Graham, Representative Lori Gramlich and other legislators to pass legislation last year, which requires that the DEP test all 700 sites for PFAS to see, you know, how kind of broad the contamination is across the state. DEP is in the process of doing that. They have, you know, tiered the sites. And so they're kind of picking sites where they think might be more contamination and kind of going down the list. And so they're in the process of doing that. DACF is working with them on that. And it's both soil and water testing. Um, so they're testing both the soil and the water. Um, and sometimes the water is contaminated and the soil isn't. Sometimes the soil is contaminated and the water isn't. It just kind of depends. So that law is in process right now. And that is why you're seeing a bunch of stories that are popping up about farm contamination. Um, the DEP also labeled PFAS as a hazardous substance, which allows them to access Superfund money. They did this last year. Um, they updated the statute of limitations. So previously, folks like Fred Stone or the Tozers or any of these other farmers that found out that they had PFAS contamination on their farms, they would not have been able to go after the responsible parties like the DuPonts and the Kimors of the world because Maine statute of limitations said you could only sue six years after the actual date of the contamination. Some mm. of this contamination goes back to the 80s and 90s. Many farms don't know that this like, like happened on their land. So um, the statute of limitations was updated to make it so that they could go after the responsible party six years from the discovery of the contamination instead of six years from the actual date of when the contamination happened, which will help, fo help folks like Fred Stone and the Tozers and these other farms be able to get some financial relief. Um, and the other thing is, so we've done a lot, so hopefully this won't take too long, but um, we set a maximum contaminant level for PFAS and drinking water. I think we're about the fourth state to do that. We followed the lead of our friends in Massachusetts and New Hampshire um, and set a standard of 20 parts per trillion for a combination of six PFAS in drinking water. And so it can be one PFAS can be over 20 parts per trillion and it would be contaminated or a combination of levels of six PFAS. However, it gets to that point, if, if any of that adds up to over 20 parts per trillion, then the water is considered above the state screening Maine standard. Um, oh, sorry, is somebody unmuted? Somebody have a question? Okay. Um, so the stand, the federal government does not have a screening level for PFAS and drinking water. They have an advisory level, but it's not enforceable. And that is 70 parts per trillion. So Maine's um, MCL for PFAS and drinking water is much lower than the federal standard. And actually the um, CDC and the main HHS have, main health and human services have said in recent statements that these levels might actually be too high as it is based on new data from the Agency for Toxic Substance Disease Registry that these levels might actually be too high to be health protective. So they're looking at that. We've banned PFAS and um, AFFF firefighting foam, um, which that's also responsible for a lot of contaminations around like air force bases and airports and stuff like that because this is the foam that is used to put out like the really really hot fires like the chemical fires there are alternatives um the bill bans it unless it's required by the federal government and there are a couple of instances where the department of defense and the faa still require it so they're still allowed to use it in those instances but the state is moving away from that as well um and then in kind of the biggest win that the state had we banned PFA, all non-essential uses of PFAS and products. This is the first in the world. Like no other nation has done this, no other state has done this, Maine is leading the way in this. So we banned 
non-essential uses of PFAS and products by 2030. So the initial category of, of products that you won't be able to use it in is rugs, carpets, and aftermarket stain treatments. And then after that, DEP will go through rulemaking to ban it and other non-essential uses. There are some essential uses, particularly in medical equipment. And obviously, as someone who has a heart valve, I want to still be able to have my heart valve and, and that type of stuff. So it, in those types of things where it's necessary for like human health, that it will still be able to be used until they find an alternative. But for stuff like your cooking pans and your, you know, your, your jackets that you wear that have it on it, like it will no longer be able to be used by 2030. So that's what we've done. What are we doing? Um, so many of you have seen the stories, I'm sure in the past like few months um, of all these farmers with their contaminated farmland. It's really awful. Um, you know, Songbird Farm, New Beat Farm, all of these farms, most of around Unity and um, Albio at this point, um, along with Fred Stone's farm down in Arundel and the Tozier's in Fairfield and all of that contamination of the drinking water wells in Fairfield. Those stories are heartbreaking and they're awful. Um, and the reason that all of that contamination is there, as I mentioned, is this sludge. It's this wastewater treatment sludge that has been used on lands for, as, a, um, as a fertilizer. And the other thing that that's used in, being used for is compost. So what is happening is wastewater treatment facilities will send that sludge to a composting facility, and then a composting facility will mix it with like other compostable materials and then sell it. So you're still getting the contamination. It's just mixed in with other, you know, with other stuff and it's being sold and there's no labeling requirements. People don't know that they're buying this stuff. Sometimes it's not even required that it be labeled as like sludge. Um, and so they're selling it. And then there's places like Hawk Ridge, which is Casella's facility up near Juniper Ridge. And that is just drying the sludge and then selling it. Like there's nothing mixed in with it. It's just sludge, but they just dried it and they're labeling it as compost. And so all of this stuff is still being spread in farms and gardens across the state. And that's leading to more and more contamination. So obviously we don't want that to happen. So LD 1911, which is a bill that we're working on with Representative Bill Pluper and Senator Stacey Brenner, will ban that use of the spreading of sludge and sludge, sludge drive compost on farmland. The other thing it will do is require, currently right now, wastewater treatment facilities, other industry, they can discharge a certain level of effluent into the water, like any waterway. Um, it's a practice that they all do. It has to be tested for things like mercury and other heavy metals and, and stuff like that to make sure that they're not discharging a bunch of that stuff into the water. But it's not currently, there's no current standard for PFAS and they don't have to test for it. So 1911 will also require that effluent be testing, be tested so we can see how much is ending up in our waterways and set a standard for PFAS and effluent so we can limit contamination going into our waterways. So that bill will probably be on the House floor on Monday. Some of, and I'm happy to answer questions. I'm sure that some folks have heard some of the pushback from municipalities, um, the Farm Bureau and Casella, and I'm happy to answer any of those questions um, once we get to that point. Um, the other bill is LD 1875. So this is a bill that we're working on with the Penobscot Nation. So what the, so land, the like Juniper Ridge landfill, other landfills have something called landfill leachate. It's basically the runoff liquid that comes out of a, a landfill. And as you can imagine, that has got a whole bunch of nasty stuff in it. And so what happens with that landfill leachate is it's sent to a wastewater treatment facility. In Juniper Ridge's case, it's sent to Nine Dragons. It's mixed in with both the sludge and the effluent. So it's ending up in the sludge and the effluent. So it's ending up on our farmland and in our rivers. And so what, what LD 1875, we originally wanted to require pre-treatment of landfill leachate. The committee decided that there just wasn't enough information on how that we could make that happen. So they turned that bill into a study. And so this will study, this requires um, the department to study how to treat landfill leachate they're gonna hire an outside consultant to look at that um, and come back next year and to the legislature and say, this is what we can do to treat this. And then the legislature can put a bill forward to require that landfill leachate treatment. So that will hopefully help limit some of this stuff ending up in our rivers and um, farmland. And so those are two bills. And then the other thing that we're working on that kind of came up last minute this session is funding for impacted farmers. So all of these farmers, you know, are have all these awful stories about, you know, losing income, all of that type of stuff. And so we're currently asking the state for $100 million for these impacted farmers and well owners. And this is LD 2013. 
what this bill will do is a bunch of different things with this funding. It will do some research, excuse me, to look at um, what are some ways to deal with PFAS in farmland, like are some crops less likely to uptake it than others? Um, can we, you know, are there ways to get it out of the soil, that type of stuff. So they'll do some research to see if we can save some of these farms and farmland. Until that research happens, it also provides some income replacement. If your farm is completely decimated, like unfortunately Songbird Farm, they're toast. Um, so they have already actually moved off their land. Um, and so that they would be eligible for like a buyback so they could get some money back for the destruction of their farmland. And the other thing it does um, is medical monitoring. So it would monitor, um, it would do health monitoring and medical monitoring for all of the farmers that are impacted as well as all the well owners that have had their wells tested high for PFAS. So there'll be some sort of medical monitoring program put in place to manage that. Um, so, you know, hopefully we can get that passed because there's a lot of people that are gonna need help. In Fairfield alone, there are over 200 contaminated wells. And if you figure, you know, two to three people, sometimes four people in a family, you're looking at four to 600, if not more people already that need medical monitoring. And that doesn't include anybody that's gonna come now as the DEP does that testing. So we really wanna make sure that there's enough funding there for people like Adam and Johanna um, of Songbird Farm, whose blood levels have tested above what you would find in a DuPont factory worker because their land is so contaminated. So it's really important for us to be able to kind of monitor the health of these folks. So that bill is currently in front of appropriations. So far, the governor has asked for 60, and we think that that's pretty safe, but we're still continuing to push for the $100 million. So that's kind of where we're at in the state of Maine. I know we had we got a question ahead of time about kind of the extent of the contamination across the state and where it's at. Um, so I'm gonna, ha Heather can share this with anybody that's registered at the end of the thing. Here are some resources where you can go and kind of check on the state of contamination in the state. So DEP has a PFAS website set up. Um, they have a bunch of information in there about testing, water testing, all of that type of stuff. And there are two maps on there. I would pull them up, but they're really, I'm afraid it'll be too glitchy in Zoom. If they're really hard to kind of maneuver with. They're not the most um, technically advanced maps, but there is a map that you can go onto. It's um, the sludge spreading map. And so when you open the map that you'll see like little, um, logos kind of across the state of where sludge has been spread and septage has been spread. And you can click on those little boxes that are on the map and it'll tell you where the license came from, kind of the farmland or, or land, not even just any land that it was spread on. Um, now to be clear, just because there was a license issue doesn't mean that it actually got spread. It just means they got permission to do so. We won't know if it's actually contaminated or been spread until DEP gets to each one of those locations, talks to folks, does some testing. So don't assume just because there's a site near where you live that it's actually contaminated. That is not the case. Um, if they just, they still need to do the testing. And even if sludge was spread on there, it still might not be contaminated because you don't know how often it was spread, that type of stuff. So the, the map is very, it kind of freaks you out when you first look at it, but you know, just realize that just because all of those spots on there doesn't mean that that's the contamination. Um, and then there's another map of currently confirmed PFAS levels that you can look at. It's got a bunch of little orange or yellow dots on it. And so when you click on a yellow dot, it will like pop up and it will tell you, you know, if it's water, if it's soil, um, you know, that type of stuff, the levels, and you can kind of, it's like a little arrow at the top of the box that pops up and you can kind of click through it and it will show you like different types of PFAS that it tested for different, you know, whether it was soil at water or, or other things that um, were tested. And so that can kind of give you an idea of, of what's already gone on. So the DEP updates those pretty consistently. The sludge spread map, the first map, they don't have all the sites uploaded yet. So, um, they're, so they can, they're continuing to update that as they find more licenses. If you have questions about getting your water tested, if you have any, if you know that like you are living on a place where sludge was spread, you can contact the DEP at this email address and they will give you information about testing, how to go through that, that type of stuff. Um, so they've got some really good information. Um, Health and Human Services Department also has some information about PFAS in drinking water. So they have like a well water fact sheet, a PFAS fact sheet, kind of accredited labs for PFAS and drinking water. So the state is testing drinking water in a couple of different ways. First off, 
A bi the bill we passed last session requires all public drinking water systems to be tested for PFAS. And it also requires all community water systems that are schools or daycares to be tested for PFAS. Um, so they are doing that anyway. But if you have a private well and you are not sure or you wanna get it tested, DP has a really big backlog and they're probably not gonna get to yours until they get to the folks that they know that there might be actual contamination. So you can do it yourself. And if it tests high for PFAS, DEP will reimburse you for the cost of that test if it tests high. If it does not test high, they are not going to reimburse you. And I will tell you that the tests run from like $250 to $500, depending. Um, but it, in order to get reimbursed from DEP, you have to use one of their accredited labs, which is what this link is here. Um, so if you do decide you want to do that, make sure you're using a DEP accredited lab, and then you can get that, um, that information back and then reach out to them. If you can't afford the high cost, feel free to reach out to our organization and we're happy to see if there's a way that we can help you get your water tested. DACF, the Department of Ag, also has a bunch of information about self-testing, kind of what's going on. They also have an emergency, um, there's an emergency relief program for farmers set up run by MOFCA and Maine Farmland Trust that can help with some income replacement and stuff right now until we get 2013 passed. So MOFCA and Maine Farmland Trust have that program set up. Um, and then there's us um, that can be helpful. My um, organizer, his name is Sergio Koweke. He um, is our water testing guru. So feel free to reach out to Sergio or myself and um, if you have any questions about that and we're happy to do that. Um, and then I mentioned some health resources. Um, Dr. Granjean's studies on immunotoxicity, um, the ATSDR, all of this type of stuff. Um, so I will, I'm happy to share all of this stuff after the fact if folks are interested. So I, from that, I will stop sharing my screen and then answer questions. Great, thank you so much, Sarah, for that um, awesome presentation. Um, so yeah, you can all put questions in the chat and I will kind of monitor that or feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question out loud um, if you would like to do that. Uh, we do have one question already that asks, um, is sludge the only source of PFAS on agricultural land or in agricultural products? So it's probably the major one um, because the so the, the sludge comes from both wastewater treatment, treatment facilities and industry, and over 95% of that sludge has tested above state screening levels. Um, so it's probably the big one. However, there is also PFAS in pesticides. So like PFAS is in the, the plastic pesticide containers that you buy. So there's some PFAS in that, which is, is also being sprayed or spread on different areas of land. Um, but in terms of like actual farmland itself, probably the sludge is the, the largest uh, culprit there. And it looks like we have another question. In addition to avoiding purchasing items with PFAS, what's your recommendation for how people should dispose of products or items that have known PFAS in them? So is there a disposal or collection process that uh, to keep them out of the general waste stream? And if not, should a household store them in the interim until there will be? So this is a really tough question because unfortunately there's no real way to destroy PFAS right now. Um, you can't incinerate it because um, incineration doesn't destroy it. It just breaks it down into smaller PFAS, which ends up in the air and it's very mobile. So if you're burning it and it's getting airborne, then it's going very far. And it's also kind of joining back up with other PFAS in the air to um, combine to form other PFAS. So it's just like a big PFAS party. Um, so unfortunately at this time, landfilling is, while it's not a great option, it's the best option. Until we figure out how to actually destroy it, the safest thing to do is for it to be landfilled. And I know that leachate discussion makes that seem kind of counterintuitive, but if we can get the leachate, like if we can get this bill passed to get the leachate treated, that will help us kind of contain it. Um, but until that point, unfortunately, we either contain it in one area, which is a landfill, or it's just kind of everywhere. And at least in a landfill, we can somewhat manage it um, and, can, and contain it. So I don't, you know, it's not a great answer. You can hang on to your household items if you want to. But, um, you know, I think I would not, don't try to, my, don't try to put them in a composting thing. That would be my thing because that's not great. Um, but other than that, I would just, unfortunately, throwing them away at this point is the, is the only real option we have. And another quick question, are there PFAS in disposable bags? Um, 
if they're treated with, if they have like a coating on them that makes them like water resistant, then probably if it's just a regular cotton that's that just doesn't feel like it's got anything on it, no. Um, it's it's really only things that have that sort of like, and you can tell like if you pick up a, a bag that's got, that feels, you know, that you can't feel the fabric, it feels like it's got something on top of it to keep it from getting wet, then that is probably PFAS, but just your regular cotton bag is probably not gonna have it in there. Great, and thank you all for your for your great questions. Keep them coming, and I will keep uh, reading them out from the chat. Uh, so the next one is: Could the impact of PFAS on children's brain function be part of the reason why we've seen an increase in the amount of students who are identified with a learning disability in recent years? And could these disabilities worsen as students age and experience more exposure? So I am not a doctor, so I'm not sure I feel 100% an, uh, com confident answering that question. My we have worked with Dr. Um, Leo Trisande from New York University a bit, and he has talked about the um, impact of these, these types of chemicals, not just PFAS, but like phthalates and other chemicals that cause neurodevelopment issues, kind of being responsible for in the uptake that we see in these, these issues that you've talked about. So um, if you're really interested in it, um, you know, I have a couple of links on that last thing, but I am hesitant to make that jump because I'm, I'm not I'm not a medical professional so I wouldn't I wouldn't feel comfortable saying that I, I'm you know I would think it might contribute to it but it's probably not the only reason our next question is are PFAS emissions in the air tested for at places that burn garbage like eco main no they are not And then with respect to the statute of limitations being extended for farmers who spread PFAS contaminated sludge on their farms, are there any lawsuits moving forward against the chemical companies like DuPont that you mentioned? Yeah, um, so I know that there are some folks in Fairfield that have joined together to do a class action lawsuit. And the state of Maine actually is in the process of doing that too. I believe they just hired a law firm to move forward with a class action lawsuit for the state itself. So there'll be a couple of different things. And I think, I think Fred and the Tozers might be working together or with the same lawyer as well for class action lawsuits. So there are a few of them going forward. Uh, the next question is how might climate change impacts crosswalk with PFAS? For example, with mosquitoes with West Nile, ticks, et cetera, should we be avoiding insecticides or other things? What about uh, flooding helping to spread PFAS wider? Yeah. So. Um, I mean, that is a concern um, that it, you know, because they are so mobile. So I don't know if folks have seen some of those stories in the past couple of weeks about like Maine's waterways and the fish testing high for PFAS, like they move very easily. And, and if it ends up in the water, then it's going to spread. Um, I, you know, for insecticides, I don't know if I would say that you should necessarily, I mean, because you also don't want like West Nile virus and ticks. Like it's, it's one of those, like you kind of have to weigh the, the options there. Um, there are some, I, I guess I would look at kind of what your, the state is moving away from allowing pesticides and insecticides from being stored in these plastic containers that contain PFAS. So, um, you know, hopefully we'll get to that point to where that stuff that you buy won't be in any sort of container that contains the PFAS in it. But until this point, like, you know, there's, a, there's the, the larger health incomes of like West Nile virus and anything that comes along with ticks that I'd be hesitant to say don't spray for them just because you don't, you also don't want to end up with like West Nile virus. So it's, it's a, I guess everybody kind of has to decide that for themselves, but like I still use, I still use, you know, bug sprays and stuff to keep that stuff off of me because I don't want to end up with those horrible things. And like I said, Maine is doing a good job of putting um, processes in place to help us move away from containers and other things that would contain, you know, that would have these things in them. So I know it's a kind of a long drawn out process in, until 2030, but they will, um, the Board of Pesticide Control is passing some requirements um, around PFAS as well. So we're slowly forcing industry, at least in this state, to move away from these chemicals and still hopefully protecting the, the public from those things like ticks and um, mosquitoes and stuff like that. Um, and kind of a good follow-up question from that. Uh, is there any testing testing happening on land that's been repeatedly treated with herbicides or pesticides, given the fact that they can contain PFAS and there's bioaccumulation over time? Thinking especially of blueberry land that has been sprayed for years. 
That is not something that is currently required in the state. The only like required testing that is happening is the sludge, where, is where the sludge has been spread. So there's no requirements for herbicides and pesticides um, where that stuff has been sprayed, so. And I'll just pause for a second. We've got through all the questions in the chat. If anybody wants to unmute and ask a question, feel free to do that. Okay, well, I'll ask a question, uh, Sarah. I'm curious if you can talk a little bit more about the opposition to the sludge bill that you mentioned, what some of the counter arguments are. And then if you could mention also just how people are able to get involved, particularly this session with these bills or beyond that, what are kind of the points where people from in the public can get involved in the process? Yeah, thanks, Sarah, absolutely. So, so LD 1911 has been an interesting fight. <laughs> um, so the original bill didn't, outright ban the use of sludge spreading, it's set screening. So slight backup. So when Fred Stone's land, it became, it became apparent where the contamination come, came from, the state set screening levels for three PFAS in sludge, the three that are most commonly found. And two of them are the ones like PFOA and PFOS, which are the most common ones that you hear about. They're no longer allowed to be manufactured in the US, but they are still allowed to be manufactured in places like China and other places. So they still end up in our products. Um, and so the state set that, those screening standards for that for the sludge. They tested all the sludge. Over 95% of the sludge came back above the state screening level. So most of it is already being landfilled. But there was a loophole in that and that they were only testing the sludge, not compost that was derived from sludge. So anything that came out of the Hawk Ridge facility, which was technically just sludge, but dried, or if there were composting, there, in, or municipalities were sending their sludge to composting facilities and mixing it with compost instead of landfilling it because it's cheaper. And so the compost was not, did not fall under those regulations. So our bill would have closed those loopholes and, and got then made it so that the sludge or that the compost also had to be tested. Well, in the process of doing this bill, all of these stories started coming out about all these contaminated farmlands. And Senator Brenner was like, look, we need to stop this outright. And we said, we agree. So they amended the bill to um, ban it outright. So <laughs> having done that, well, uh, you know, having done that, that took away the avenue for some, some cheap disposal of this stuff by municipalities who were sending it to Hawks Ridge, who were sending it to other composting facilities. Um, and so, even though 95% of it was you know, still being landfill, moving that 95% to 100% kind of made Casella angry because that meant that they're gonna have to do something with their Hawk Ridge facility. Um, and that kind of fear mongering went down into the municipalities. So the municipalities have kind of heard from Casella and Hawk Ridge and Juniper Ridge. So Juniper Ridge is a state run landfill, but Casella manages it. Um, and so they kind of heard that there's not enough capacity in the landfill for all the sludge. There's, it's gonna, you're gonna have to start paying all of this extra money to landfill as opposed to um, being able to compost it. So those are the pushback that we're getting from municipalities is that, and then also they, some of the farmers got freaked out because this is a real cheap source of fertilizer for farmland. And so they you know, kind of heard that, oh my God, you're gonna lo lose all this cheap source of fertilizer. Never minding the fact that they've already lost most of it since 90, since 2018 when the DEP put those standards in. So, so we're hearing from municipalities that they're concerned about capacity in Juniper Ridge. The DEP has said many, many times that that is not a concern, that there is capacity in Juniper Ridge, even if all of the sludge in the state that is not currently being landfilled or is sending to composting facilities gets sent to Juniper Ridge, it will increase the percentage of sludge at the Juniper Ridge as like kind of their overall landfill capacity. Right now it's about 7% of their landfill is being taken up by sludge. We landfill all of it, it will go up to 9.7%. That is a small portion of the landfill. Um, and the DEP has said numerous times that there's that capacity there. So we're trying to let municipalities know that, but they're still kind of hearing from Casella, that's not the case, even though DEP has said that's the case, it's a whole thing, it's politics. And then the other thing is that, you know, municipalities, they might, I mean, we, it's true, unfortunately, that 
probably some of the costs for some of the municipalities will increase because they'll have to truck it to Juniper Ridge um, as opposed to being able to send it to a composting facility that's closer or spreading it on farmland that's closer. But that cost is minimal compared to what the state is spending to clean this up. That cost is minimal compared to what these farmers are going through. Like I think Lewiston said it might increase their yearly costs like by 300,000. And if you divvy that up between each of the ratepayers in their district, it's not a lot of money. Um, we're looking at Songbird Farm, hundreds of thousands of dollars for one farm. So, you know, so we have an entire sewer district where residents might maybe have to pay another dollar a year or another, you know, or completely destroyed farmland. Not to mention the health impacts, which people are not talking about. They're only talking about money at this point. So while we are sympathetic to the municipalities maybe having some increased costs, our concern is on the destruction of Maine's vital resources. Not only our farmland, this stuff is ending up in our rivers and our oceans. There's levels of fish, there's levels in seafood. Like these are massive industries for the state of Maine, not to mention the tourism. Like if we've got contaminated rivers and streams, nobody's gonna wanna come and play in them. Um, and so while we're sympathetic to the, the municipalities like increased cost argument, it's kind of fiscally irresponsible to ask the state for $100 million for cleanup and to help these farmers, yet still continue the process and the practice of spreading this stuff. So that's kind of where we're at with 1911. Like I said, it, 1875, the leachate one, nobody has any concern with that one. That one is fine. Um, that one has, has been unanimously adopted in, in both, um, has like one more hurdle to jump in the Senate and we have no concerns with that. So that one's not a problem. People are super supportive of the $100 million for the farmers. It's just a question of what, whether or not there's an additional $40 million sitting someplace that we can take to, to finalize that. But in terms of helping the farmers, nobody has concerns with that. The concern is with LE 1911 and that bill is coming up on Monday. I know that like a gunquit just sent the most fear mongering letter to their ratepayers yesterday. We got forwarded it by um, somebody that is a supporter of ours that lives in that district. So um, I guess, you know, you just kind of have to decide what is the bigger concern for you, the health impacts on our population, the destruction of our farmland, um, or some additional costs for a municipality to landfill it. And I will say in LD 1911, there is language in there that, in, so in LD 1600, which was passed last year, which requires the landfilling, we added an additional fee on landfilling to help pay for the testing. Um, so that cost would have landed on municipalities. So LD 1911 um, rescinds that fee. So um, they're taking away part of the fee that we put on them last year to help the municipalities. So there is some financial re relief in 1911, um, but it, it's just not gonna pay for all of the additional landfilling costs. So, um, but from our perspective, the health of our, the health of our communities is, more, is a little bit more important than that, as is kind of the protection of our, our you know, beautiful land across the state. So I see a couple more questions of kind of, so anyway, if you want to get involved, if you live, you know, if you feel like reaching out to your legislators and telling them you support LD1911, we would greatly appreciate that. If you hear from your municipalities about their concerns, any sort of response to them saying, you know, sympathetic to the kind of cost increase, but the protection of our land and our health is more important, that would also be great, um, mm -hmm. whatever you feel comfortable with. And I have talking points. If anybody wants them, I'm happy to email them to you. Um, you know, so just let me know. Great, thanks for that, Sarah. Um, it looks like the next question in the chat, hopefully I'm not missing anything, is are there any hopeful ideas about cleaning PFAS contaminated land? And I see that Becca did um, drop a link in here to some recent coverage about using hemp. Um, so thanks for that, Becca. But yeah, Sarah, anything you wanna add on that? Yeah, unfortunately there is not any um, anything we have right now for cleaning farmland. The federal government is in the process of a bunch of different studies about destruction of PFAS. Um, so finger, and it, they've had some minor successes it sounds like. So our hope is, is in the next few years, this research that these scientists are doing will lead to something that will allow us to just be able to destroy it, which would be fantastic, but we're not there yet. And in terms of the hemp thing that Becca sent, it's amazing. Hemp is pulling it out of the soil. It's great. The only problem becomes is you still have to dispose of the hemp. Um, so what do you do with the PFAS contaminated hemp after the fact? 
However, having said that, it's very promising. And I know that a lot of the tribal communities, um, the tribal communities here in Maine are doing some of this work with them and some research around. And that is promising from a kind of farming perspective because it can help them look at what, um, what things might exhibit the same properties as hemp and be able to like grow those as a product as opposed to what they're doing right now. So, um, so there's, you know, there's some good research around that and like, some products don't pull it up as high, like corn, you know, takes it up, but then like, it looks, sounds like maybe some of the spinach and stuff doesn't uptake as much. And so it just kind of depends on the plants. Um, and so they, they have to do, and the state is actually doing that research right now. Um, the CDC is looking at different, um, different farm products to see where, you know, where it's showing up in higher levels and, and, and hopes to come up with some plans for some of these farmers for them to be able to grow products that don't exhibit, that don't uptake hemp or don't uptake PFAS as much as say like corn. Um, you know, unfortunately because of water contamination, it shows up really easily in dairy cattle or beef cattle. Um, but in terms of some of the growing product, there is there are some that don't, that don't uptake it um, as much as others. So there might be some hope there for some farmers in that, you know, and they can grow specific crops that just don't get contaminated. Great, thanks for adding that, Sarah. Um, I think the only other question we had was about <clears throat> sharing links from the presentation. And as Heather mentioned, um, we'll email the slides around to everybody um, and include the links in that. Uh, I did have one last question for you, Sarah, unless anybody else feel free still to, um, to pop those in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, I saw a recent article about PFAS in pine needles uh, and it was talking about potentially using them for monitoring like air contamination with PFAS. But I also had the thought, I wonder if any of it is coming from the soil. And it's so I was, it was making me think of that when you mentioned different plants take up, take it up or don't. Um, so I was just curious if, if you had seen that or if you have um, any thoughts I, I about have, that. I mean, particularly I, when we're in the pine tree state, so. Yeah. I haven't actually, but I, you know, Sarah, if you think about it, send me that article. Um, yeah, but yeah, that is a good point. Like they up to, like it is uptaken from the soil. So it might, they, they might not be getting that PFAS from the air. It might be something that if the soil is contaminated. So like, even if it, it might not be sludge spreading, but like I mentioned, um, it isn't some pesticides and, and stuff like that. So I know in Maine, um, there's a lot of places, particularly in the North woods where they spray pesticides um, or herbicides to kind of protect the, you know, protect the, I, we can argue whether or not that actually protects the forest. Um, but the, so there's PFAS in that. So is it the pine, is it, is the PFAS coming from uptake into the plant? Is it coming from something that might've been sprayed in the air or is it just actual PFAS kind of traveling across, you know, across, which it does, like it's very, like I said, it's very mobile. It can get airborne. It can be in the water. It can be kind of every place. So, you know, so that, you know, at the end of the day, we just need to stop using this stuff. And, you know, Maine is, is kind of leading the way in that, which is, you know, I know it's really scary right now for a lot of the farmers here because Maine is the only one that's that's dealing with this, but it's Maine is not going to be the only one. It's starting to trickle in other states. And I think we'll actually be in a really good spot at the end of all of this because we've taken action kind of quicker than anybody. So I think in the long run, um, as frustrating as it is to deal with all these issues right now, I think we're actually gonna be kind of ahead of the curve on, in a lot of ways for many other states that are dealing with this. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, and I'm just going to put a little plug in that Defend Our Health does a lot more than just PFAS, as Sarah alluded to earlier. They do lots of other stuff as well. So I'm just dropping a link in the chat to their action page where you can take action on a bunch of different issues that they're working on uh, in case you're feeling inspired. And like Sarah said, call call your legislators, talk to people. It's all good. Um, yeah, and we'll also, like I said, if you're interested in getting engaged, involved, my email, uh, I'll drop it in the chat right now, but also um, it will be on the presentation. Um, and I'm happy to share talking points or anything on any of these bills, particularly 1911. And then also just in terms of regular random stuff that we do, we're doing a lot of work around um, drinking, like access to clean drinking water. And we have another bill, LD 1891 that will provide some funding for the Maine Housing Authority to help low-income Mainers um, whose wells test high for contaminants to get money to fix those wells. So we do a lot of stuff around like access to clean drinking water. We're also working on all the tribal sovereignty stuff. So um, if folks wanna get engaged on any of that, you know, let me know. All right, I don't think 
I'm seeing any other questions or hands raised. So I just wanted to, to quickly thank both Sarah Woodbury and Sarah Bridges for being here today for today's presentation. Really appreciate you both taking the time to present on your work and to, to facilitate and moderate Sarah. And many thanks to everybody for attending today. We really, really appreciate it. Um, as I mentioned, today's event is recorded and we'll send out the recording um, once it gets uploaded along with the presentation that has the links and we'll make sure that you have Sarah's email as well so that you can get involved in any way or follow up with any additional questions. Um, so please join us tomorrow afternoon if you're a member for our walk and networking event. Um, and otherwise, have a great day. And thanks so much to everybody. We appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. You really, really appreciate your time.